A very good morning to everybody. And it's an absolute pleasure to be back on day two of the NASCOM Retail Tech Day. It's, it's been a fantastic day one with our speakers sharing with us on overhaul in retail, the way forward was our theme. And we talked about how are they reacting to the current situation? How are companies reacting to the current situation? What are the fundamentals of the retail sector that will change forever? And what are their strategies and predictions post and post the COVID era? Today, we, we have the theme, innovation vital for the next retail horizon. Retail enterprises that leverage innovation partners, such as product technology companies, service providers, startups, and academia, and consider them as a part of their long-term implementation roadmap witness early benefits and a higher success rate than companies that plan to do everything themselves. We are fortunate to have a number of international speakers and industry thought leaders who are sharing their views on technology transforming, transforming the retail industry. The collective efforts and thoughts on latest trends and best practices in retail technology have benefited all of us in our learning journey. Today, we will have leaders sharing their perspective on how important it is to leverage innovation partners in the current scenario, what's their approach towards innovating with startups, initial success stories of co-innovation with startups. And before I introduce our star speaker who has been kind enough to you know, wake up early in the morning to be with us uh, today, I must thank our, uh, all our panelists, all our audiences, uh, the team behind this from, from our events partner to the NASCOM team that's made this uh, you know, uh, possible. I, I strongly think the biggest part of digital innovation is the way we think. And today is the perfect setting where we'll be focusing on conscious digital innovation and various new models that define the next horizon of retail. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Dave Richards, our keynote speaker for today. He will be speaking with us on leading conscious innovation. He's the MIT Innovation Lab co-founder and an author, speaker, and mentor on conscious digital innovation at Passion Global Innovation. His passion is supporting entrepreneurial leaders and teams in achieving growth. He improves how leaders and teams come together effectively to drive all forms of innovation, customer experience, business performance, and bottom line results. He loves speaking on topics such as artificial or augmented intelligence and the future of work. The Seven Sins of Innovation, a strategic model for entrepreneurship. His book, which according to the Chief Strategy Officer of 3M, elevates the thinking on this crucial subject to the highest level. Dr. Dave, I cannot thank you enough, and I'm absolutely privileged and honored to have you with us. And with that, the stage is all yours, and I'm sure the audience are waiting to hear you. Thank you again, and the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to join you. Um, so, a key question we all, I'm sure, have the right answer to is, do we want to live our lives consciously or unconsciously, right? Do we want to bring, do we want to lead consciously or unconsciously? Do we want to do business consciously or unconsciously? So clearly the answer is we need greater consciousness uh, in all aspects of human enterprise and life. And uh, I've tried to, uh, I'm going to try to uh, convey that message and summarize uh, what is really several decades of experience uh, in R&D and innovation environments, uh, product development, uh, product management, uh, leading to global P&L responsibility for business units, uh, driving digital innovation. And, uh, and as you know, along the way, co-founding uh, and participating in the MIT Innovation Lab, which was a, an amazing opportunity to learn 
from other innovation leaders. And, and we learned so much from each other, especially when we began, well, when we stopped bragging about how wonderful we were and, uh, uh, and showing off uh, all our fantastic uh, innovation uh, initiatives. When we, when we shifted from uh, bragging and showing off to sharing our pain uh, and uh, sharing what keeps us up at night and our nightmares and that sort of thing and our, and our worst mistakes. Uh, when we began sharing very honestly, uh, the learning just increased exponentially. And uh, so next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about bringing consciousness to the process of leading innovation. So the first thing I'd like to touch on briefly is what is leadership? Um, the ancient Greek word, word strategos, uh, was the word used to describe the ultimate leader, the, the general Alexander the Great. Uh, and it also described his art. Um, in other words, it described the art of uh, being a general. And that art, of course, now is also a bit of a science. So leadership is, is still an art, um, but we have uh, hundreds of years of, uh, of uh, understanding of what makes good or bad or in between mediocre leaders. And, uh, and of course, a lot of that's encapsulated in this uh, concept uh, that's uh, expressed by Sun Tzu. Uh, that nothing is more difficult than maneuvering for strategic advantage. So in many ways, that's what strategy is all about. If you maneuver for strategic advantage, if you put yourself in a winning position, then you're more likely to win. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of information on this slide, and I'm not going to read all of it to you. But the point is that strategy has structure. And again, the key requirement is to bring a very conscious mindset to the process of developing and implementing strategy. So we've all heard of the concept of strategic planning. That's the first part. But of course, a strategy isn't just a plan. It's also action and implementation. So this slide attempts to capture what, how I view the structure of strategy and the elements of consciousness that you have to bring to strategy. So starting at the very top is your purpose. If you don't have a purpose, right, you may as well pack it up and go home. Uh, if you don't have a specific mission as a, as a leader, uh, if your strategy doesn't have a purpose, then there's, it's pointless. So that's the mission. Next, of course, you need to have a clear vision of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, we've heard terms probably like, uh, you know, big audacious uh, goals and so on. Uh, and that's what a vision is all about. It, it defines the mountain that you want to climb. It defines what winning looks like. And of course, it's not a simple thing. It's not, you know, you can't usually just say there's one goal that is your vision. There's usually one goal at the top, and then there's a whole cluster of goals around that, that you have to achieve all of them in order to ultimately achieve that top goal. So again, you've got to bring a very conscious uh, approach to understanding what your, what your vision is. The next realm of strategy is about communication. It's about expressing, articulating, uh, what you're doing. If other people don't understand the strategy, they won't be able to help implement it. Uh, also, if other people aren't convinced that it's the right strategy and they're just blindly following you, they're, they're not going to be very good uh, at, what they, at what they do. You know, the best soldiers are soldiers who are also very conscious and, and very capable and, and empowered, not just blind followers. So that realm of communication, and then that extends down into engagement of all stakeholders, all, all the people involved in implementing the strategy, but also your, your customers, your, your, uh, your investors, 
And then further that extends down into uh, the realm of leadership and empowering resources and then uh, uh, making sure that people uh, really understand what they're supposed to do and, and also pick up responsibility and lead themselves. And beneath that, the realm of creativity and, and R&D. And then at the bottom level, implementation, where of course you, uh, the rubber meets the road, as some people say, and that's where you, uh, it, you see what happens, right? You implement your strategy and you see what happens. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, one key point. Then uh, also, of course, uh, we can talk about high level long-term strategies, which uh, the things at the top of the pyramid, the top of the pyramid is smaller because it doesn't change as much. And as you go down, of course, there's more change and, and more complexity and, uh, uh, and therefore more detail. And, uh, and often, uh, yeah, your more detailed plans. So next slide now, please. So on the next slide, the key point is that culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? What that means is if you've got the wrong kind of culture, the wrong uh, psychology, the wrong attitudes, the wrong beliefs or motivations within your team or your organization, then even the best planned strategy will fail, guaranteed. Next slide, please. So my thinking and what I'm trying to convey to you here is that to bring a conscious approach to strategy, you really need to effectively bridge between the aspects of strategy on the left and aspects of psychology on the right, which actually, as you can see, line up with the aspects of strategy. Um, so you've got um, uh, at the psychological level, you've got uh, a person's uh, sense of purpose, what they're passionate about, what they love, what, you know, they're, they're, what, what do they really want to do? What's their mission in life? Uh, next, you've got, of course, their, their aspirations and their goals, their vision for their life. Uh, next, you've got their ability to communicate, their ability to influence, right? Their, their voice, their, uh, their ability to uh, courageously and authentically express themselves. Then you've got the heart, right? You've got their ability to be empathic and you've got their ability to love and be loved and to love themselves. Next, you've got the power chakra, right? Where you've got you, your power as a leader and your ability to empower others. That's of course also about focus. That's about deciding what to uh, focus on and so on. And then you've got the realm of creativity and ideas and then ultimately beneath on the root chakra, you've got uh, actual activity and, uh, and so on. So those directly connect across to the uh, aspects or the elements of strategy from mission on down to implementation. But these bridging agendas uh, are actually things that they connect the two sides, but not, uh, not directly as you might think. So if I can show that more easily on the next slide. So these bridging agendas, actually in a way they connect the, they connect the elements of strategy uh, or uh, with those of psychology, but by bridging both, uh, both sides, but by connecting actually four things. So if you look at strategic intent here, uh, considering strategy, strategic intent is actually a coin. If you think of it as a coin, it's got two sides. One side is what's the purpose? What's the mission? The other side is what's the vision? What are you trying to achieve, right? So strategic intent embraces both of those things. And therefore, it actually bridges between strategy, mission, and vision on the left over to the psychology, the passionate purpose, and the, and the aspirations and goals of an individual, and it bridges those things. So the point is, the, these middle agendas need to actually engage people psychologically in conscious effort to express and achieve strategy and in this case strategic intent but that 
same thing works all the way down. So beneath strategic intent, you need good intelligence. If you don't have good intelligence, you're going to you're going to lose the war, right? No matter what war it is, whether it's a war of dominating an industry or a war against uh, coronavirus or whatever war it is, you need intelligence. You need you need to be able to see and understand your environment to know what to do in order to win. And beneath that, you've got to be absolutely clear on value, the value you're trying to bring to the world at a high level, but also all of the values that inform how you're going to do it, that, that uh, you know, values of integrity and, and honesty and all of those kinds of things. And then beneath that, you need to, you've got the realm of relationships and your ability to, your ability to engage. So you can see that relationships ties together in engagement, leadership, which, which finds who you're going to focus on and how you're going to engage them, uh, empathy and love, and also, of course, uh, focus and power. So all of those things need to come together to have effective relationships. And as you can see, all of these things are interconnected. All of them are interconnected. Then you've got below, beneath relationships, your, your, in a sense, your change agenda. How, what transformation are you trying to drive? How are you, what are you trying to change? If you're not trying to change anything, of course, you're doing nothing. So all strategies are about change. And then you've got the realm of creativity. And then, of course, results. And results you see is at the top and the bottom because the model is circular. So uh, next slide, we'll show it again in a slightly different way. So you, I think of this as, in a way, the, the bridging agendas are like DNA, right? They, they stick the two sides together. They stick together the soft, soft stuff of psychology and culture with the hard stuff of strategy. And uh, as you can see, I think, the, again, it's just showing how these things stick together. But ultimately, what's the purpose of having good, strong DNA, good innovation DNA here? It's to create what I call flow, right? Flow is about peak performance. It's about achieving your results. It's about, it's about being successful in your strategy. Next slide, please. So what does flow look like in the real world, right? It's, it's peak performance of, of, for example, athletes, it's, uh, it's, it's joyful life uh, in, in terms of conscious living. Um, but look at this theoretically, you've got these seven chakras, right? And if they're all perfectly open, if they're all perfectly designed and the DNA is strong, as strong as possible, if it's perfect, then the result is one times one, right? Seven times is the answer is one. You've got perfect flow, 100%, right? If you've got, total blockage in one chakra, it's zero. And as you absolutely see, the end result is zero flow. Now that's theoretical because nothing is ever perfect and nothing is ever perfectly bad. Next slide, please. So the real world looks more like this, right? Where in an organization, if I look at them, and I've looked at lots of organizations and I've assessed their ability to innovate in this way, and I might give them 80% on one and 70% on something and 90% and 50% and so on. And the, and the typical results, you know, around 0.05. And in fact, if you look at innovation success rates across all industries, and many people have done this, Doblin Group and others, innovation success rates tend to be below 10%. In fact, they they range from sort of 1%, you know, 5%, 6, 7%. So this is innovation is very difficult. Why? Because of the psychology and because it's difficult to bridge between psychology and strategy and to bring real conscious leadership to the whole process. Now, you see what happens if you focus on improvement and maybe you improve to 0.9 across the board, you can, you can have a 10x improvement. So that's the goal. Next slide, please. So what, is, what does this look like in the real world? I'm just using one metaphor here. I could have used airplanes or cars or anything, but use bus 
you know, because we often we think of as leaders, we want to get people on our bus and working with us and, and so on. So what it looks like when you've got uh, blockage in any of the seven chakras is this. If you lack purpose and drive, right, you're going to crash. If you're on un an unclear vision and direction, you're going to crash. Um, the screen just changed. Is there a reason for that? Anyway, you can see that if you've got blockage in any of the uh, in any of the chakras, you're going to have a problem. Are we okay? Okay. Can we go back to the other screen view? Okay. Well, let's go to the next slide. So. This simply summarizes the seven sins of innovation. And, and for every sin, of course, of course, there's a virtue. There's two sides to every coin. So the top sin, of course, is, is having a pointless purpose or no purpose at all. Uh, I'd really like to go back to the way I was seeing the uh, main sort of portal view or whatever it was before, which I'm no longer seeing. I'm now, do you know what I mean? because that way I can see my slides better and I can therefore talk to them better. Is that possible? Um, and uh, the corresponding uh, sin, of course, is to, uh, is, yeah, sorry, the sin is to no purpose or pointless purpose. The virtue is, of course, having a very passionate purpose. And you can read all the way down so you can have real clear vision or you can be completely blind or have impaired vision. You can, uh, you can have, uh, really good communication and expression, or you can have uh, what I call apathetic miscommunication. So we're bad at communicating and we don't care. Um, you, in level of engagement, you can be very highly engaged or you can be totally disengaged. Level of power, you can have a, a culture of fear versus a culture of empowered leadership and servant leadership. And then in creativity, you can be amazingly creative or you can be boring and uncreative. And then finally, uh, you, can, uh, you can be you know, really acting uh, very uh, properly or you can be uh, just completely um, apathetic and, and uh, complacent. And uh, I think you can see complacency in many forms. Often, uh, often it's arrogance. So organizations can be very arrogant. That turns into complacency. They say, we don't need to worry about this stuff. We're good enough as we are. Next slide, please. So this just uh, shows in a way that I'm just relating it to uh, another person's thoughts here, namely Steve Jobs. Uh, and his thoughts were uh, published posthumously by Gallo. Um, but again, you can see that, uh, that Steve's thoughts on innovation uh, and the so-called innovation secrets uh, pretty much line up with, uh, with mine, just uh, change the order a bit. The uh, tornado at the bottom illustrates that uh, it takes a lot of ideas, a lot of uh, little specks of gold dust uh, to ultimately turn into gold bricks. And the way good leaders uh, consciously drive that is by killing good ideas quickly and focusing on the great ideas. So, the, you know, you, you narrow the tornado as quickly as possible. So you're really laser focused as opposed to if you've got it like a funnel like that, you're wasting a lot of resource. Next slide, please. So this just again relates it to uh, another realm or another organization's thoughts on innovation. Google has eight pillars of innovation. As you can see, in my view, two of them relate to the same thing. Um, and uh, you can read the different uh, expressions, but as you can see, they line up again to uh, my views on conscious uh, strategy and leading. And uh, the little illustration in the bottom left is looking down at the top of the uh, tornado and making the point that there are lots and lots of specific ways of widening the top of that tornado so that you capture as many ideas as possible. Things like looking at, out at the real world, market research, competitive analysis, uh, a lot of them leading to intelligence. Next slide, please. So 
so uh, this just uh, relates to another uh, set of uh, my thoughts on uh, customer experience and just shows that, of course, the, uh, the seven sins can compromise customer experience and just as the virtues and building those virtues and building flow can lead to really great customer experience. And uh, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend reading uh, Nine and a Half Things You'd Do Differently If Disney Ran Your Hospital. I, I love that book and it's uh, highly applicable and I've used it working with healthcare organizations, but I also have used the same uh, thought process and, and worked with many different kinds of organizations and talked about and looked at Nine and a Half Things You'd Do Differently If You Were Disney. It's a good book. Next slide, please. So that'll conclude my uh, remarks. I'm sorry, I can see I ran a little bit over time. I apologize. I hope we still have time for uh, some questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dave. That was uh, really, really wonderful. Yes, we would love to take a couple of questions. We do have a few minutes because we, we started a couple of minutes uh, late. Um, so I'm going to dive into uh, the questions that I see on the Q&A chat. Uh, the first question is, any best, best practices that you recommend to drive the culture of conscious innovation within, the, within an organization or startup ecosystem? Yeah, really uh, everything I just said. Um, but uh, yes, it's, I mean, a key, if I were to try and summarize, uh, the, probably the top thing is engagement you need people to be engaged. And of course, uh, we saw recently a, a global survey done by uh, Gartner, uh, I think it was Gartner Group, um, that said that uh, globally, less than 30% uh, of workforces are actually engaged. And uh, I think they said the figure in the United States was about 40% on average. I don't recall what they said about India, but I think it was around 30 or maybe lower. Um, so, you know, the point is that um, people are often disengaged and what you, you need to change that, right? And ultimately you need, you need to try to engage people. In, and if you can get engagement up to the 70, 80% level, you're going to massively improve. Uh, and so, yeah, bring a very, as a leader, consciously focus on making sure people are engaged. And if, if you find people who won't engage, say goodbye <laughs> and uh, find people who will. And, and similarly though, most people will engage uh, and a lot of it is about making them consciously aware of purpose. I mean, how many of you, how many employees in organizations really understand the purpose and really feel connected to it? And how many, you know, if I, if I go into organizations, I say, and I just pick on people randomly and I say, what's the purpose of this organization? Why are you here? What's your purpose here? How are you contributing to the overall purpose? You know, people are often like, um, um, mm, you know, not sure, right? They're disengaged. So again, find a way to engage them in every single aspect of conscious strategy. Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you. I think that also answers another question that we had, which was uh, innovation strategies are often faced with internal resistance from the teams. How do you think um, uh, great companies have been able to manage internal teams to embrace change to consistently innovate, especially at the bottom of the strategy pyramid, right? Yeah. I think well, pretty... that's that's a great question uh, as well. And uh, yeah, resistance is a really interesting phenomenon. So as, as a leader, you're trying to drive strategic change. You're trying to do that very consciously and you will find people resist. And often we think of resistance as a, as a bad thing. You want to counter it. You want to get rid of it. You want to stamp it out. Um, I say engage it. Resistance is a good thing. If somebody's resisting, they obviously care. That's good for a start. And the point is, if people are resisting uh, a change or if they're resisting uh, a direction, it's because they have concerns. It's because they either, they, maybe they don't understand. Maybe they don't completely understand the intelligence. Maybe they, you know, they, they, uh, they have fear, right? The fear is underlying their resistance. So 
people need to overcome fear. And one way to overcome fear is to make them more conscious of, you know, the good things that are going to happen when we achieve this strategy. And yes, um, of course, you might be you might be fearful of of something. The other the other key point is if somebody's fearful of something, it may be because they have sight of a problem or they understand a potential risk which you need to be aware of, right? So sometimes resistance is because people are are more aware of a risk than the leader is, right? So leaders need to not only speak and, and direct, they also need to listen and be aware. They need to be conscious in every sense. Well, that's, that's uh, truly insightful. Uh, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, we'll take one last question. Um, you know, I think with, with the current times, I think this is more and more in the forefront for all of us. The question is, uh, what is your take on government's role in building innovation and startup ecosystem in the country? I'm sorry, Kritika, you're, uh, you cut out a little bit while you were asking. Okay, so, so the other question was, you know, in, in the current times, uh, what is your take on government's role in building innovation and the startup ecosystem in the country? Well, I think, I think uh, government uh, plays a very important role in terms of um, enabling ecosystems to fall into place. I personally don't think that, I mean, and I also think that governments need to be innovative themselves. Governments need to be far more innovative and bring more conscious innovation into their own strategic thinking and planning uh, about you know everything, how to uh, how to counter uh, COVID nineteen and and get through this crisis, uh, how to uh, you know how to lead the uh, how to lead India to the five trillion dollar economy. Uh, that's going to take a lot of uh, conscious leadership on the part of the governments and a lot of innovative thinking. But I know your question is more about uh, what should uh, governments do in terms of creating a good ecosystem. I think it's one of enabling. It's so it's like partnering with organizations like like NASCOM. Uh, it's uh, and uh, you know organizations like Pratty and Global Innovation, and uh, it's about uh, encouraging investment, encouraging entrepreneurship. It's about uh, I think governments play a key role in terms of the education system. So it's about looking at the education system and why isn't the education system teaching consciousness? Why isn't it teaching strategy? Why isn't it teaching important life skills? Why isn't it teaching communication, right? What, what's all this, uh, you know, boring focus on, on what we thought was relevant 50 years ago when I was a kid, right? I mean, right. come on, get with the program, get with, get with the modern uh, days and, and teach, uh, teach innovation skills. And, uh, yeah, you know, those are the sorts of things I think the government should be uh, focused on. Right. Uh, uh, Dr. Dave, there, there are tons of questions that are pouring in. And uh, just to be fair to, you know, the audience, I definitely like to take two more questions, if you don't mind. And I request our panelists for the next to kindly bear with me on this. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just want to be fair to, to all yeah. of who, who logged in, uh, you know, to answer some of these questions. Yeah, I, I apologize for taking so long with uh, my my talk and, and no, uh, no, that was absolutely but, uh, wonderful. So, so and, Dr. and I'm I'm fine. I can stay on for as long as you want. I'm I'm absolutely fine. It's uh, very early in the morning here still, so long <laughs> way ahead. So, yeah. Uh, uh, so, so, Doctor, one question, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to pick a couple of them out of here because there are loads of questions here. One is. Uh, uh, how do you eliminate uh, failures in uh, innovation? Um, Vijayan asks us this question on how to eliminate failures in innovation. Well, I don't think I don't think it's about eliminating failures. I think it's about learning from them. So, if we're you know if we're not if you're not making any mistakes, you're not trying hard enough, and so we are going to make mistakes. We are we are going to quote unquote fail. Um, but when we fail, failure can be, uh, can be a good opportunity for success, right? Because failure can be an opportunity to learn. And if you pick up the pieces from failure properly, instead of just trying to eliminate it and sweep it under the carpet or, or push it out the door, 
Right. Uh, you really, if you if you fail at any aspect of innovation or any aspect of strategy, you really should do a forensic analysis. You really want to understand exactly why it failed and learn from it. Right. Okay. <laughs> the other question is, um, innovation requires a lot of investment. And typically, if we are talking of AI and ML, then there would be requirement of data as well. For first-time ent entrepreneurs, how can this be possible? And how do we work around something like this? Well, I think um, one way is to uh, find the right ecosystem to uh, work in. So, for example, one of the reasons I'm really excited about uh, Pratian Global Innovation uh, and working on that is that uh, it's a fantastic ecosystem to bring in uh, entrepreneurs uh, with, and they have their particular entrepreneurial focus, but be, within the ecosystem is a whole massive capability ability uh, for uh, things like augmented intelligence and, and cutting edge uh, technology innovation. So uh, the short answer is that if, uh, if entrepreneurs get connected into an effective ecosystem, uh, then they don't have to do everything from scratch, right? They, 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 if they get involved in an ecosystem where they've got access to investment, they've got access to, to, to leading technology skills, they've got access to talent, They've got access to uh, to mentors who, who have been there and done that and got the T-shirt. Uh, so they've got all of those things within uh, within a good ecosystem, and therefore they don't need to reinvent the wheel, you know, eighty times. Right. Right. No, that's, uh, we can just go on, Dr. Dave. I think I have the perfect last question to uh, you know. Uh, 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 we don't like to end this conversation, but yeah, we, we will have to at some point. So uh, I, I'll end this thing with uh, one last question from uh, one of our participants, which says, um, do you have any suggestions or any models for the Indian context? Yeah, um, I think, well, personally, I think my, uh, the model I showed you, I think, is, I hope uh, people can resonate with the concept of chakras. I, of course, stole that from India. Uh, it's uh, stole that from Ayurveda. I've, I've stolen ideas shamelessly, of course. There's not a single new idea in my book. It's really just a synthesis of uh, everybody else's great ideas. Um, but I think, uh, I, I think the other thing I would say is, uh, and this comes back and relates to government, but it also, it's a challenge for all Indian leaders to bring, uh, to bring greater consciousness. I think India as a culture globally is ideally placed to be a major leader in conscious digital innovation. Uh, as you know, NASCOM's mission of course is uh, when you think digital, you want to think India, right? And, uh, and that's great. But I think, I think there's another spin on it, which is that uh, Indian culture, I think, in, in the global context, if you look at Indian culture compared to you know, Chinese, American, British, everything else, um, India, I think, is a culture that's more naturally uh, predisposed toward consciousness. Okay, so uh, things like, uh, I'm, I'm not saying other people don't meditate. I've been meditating since 1970, but I was meditating, having learned to meditate based on Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, right? Uh, Transcendental meditation. And uh, since then, of course, I've, I've also incorporated practices from others, mostly Indian, right? And uh, so India, I think, has a, has a global role to play in terms of uh, bringing greater consciousness to the planet Earth, to humanity of all cultures. And I think the other nice thing about Indian culture is I think Indian culture is very inclusive, right? I, I don't think I've ever met anyone, or if I did, they hid it very well. I don't think I've ever met anyone from India who was, say, a racist toward me or looked down on me, right? I, I think that... Indians are naturally uh, people who embrace other people and other cultures and other, and even the, you know, the way uh, you, you look at, um, you know, Hinduism, that's an amalgamation of many, many different uh, beliefs and thought systems. And it resulted because Indians are very tolerant of other people having slightly different views about 
you know, their god or their or or what's important and so on. So I think India is ideally placed to bring greater consciousness uh, to the world. And if you, that's why I think conscious digital innovation is something that can really be led by India with a little help from its friends like me and others. You, know? right. you, you, can, you can have a lot of friends help you in that journey. Oh, thank you, Dr. Dave. This has been absolutely uh, wonderful and we've been absolutely privileged and I can't really thank you enough. And we will continue our conversations going forward and we will find multiple opportunities you know, consenting from your end to come and speak to our audiences on, on in, in different ways. And we will look forward to building this relationship further and growing the whole innovation index in India. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dave, and an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm sure all of you enjoyed this phenomenal keynote and some brilliant uh, takeaways that we have. And uh, with that, it's time to move on to our panel discussion. Innovation, not an option, but necessity, right? And to moderate that, I'd like to call upon Kapil Makija, CEO of Unicommerce. Uh, Kapil is a seasoned management professional with a 14 plus years of experience across e-commerce, management consulting, and technology in both B2B and B2C companies. He has deep expertise in growth strategy, go-to-market strategy, business planning, market assessment, customer service improvement, cost reduction, supply chain, and operational efficiency improvement across multiple industries. He has successfully demonstrated scaling up and sustaining new businesses in a startup environment with significant experience on working with SMEs in India. Uh, Kapil, with that, I like to hand over the stage to you to introduce our panelists and look forward to a wonderful discussion. Kapil, all yours. Thanks, Kritika. Uh, uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. Uh, welcome to today's panel discussion on why innovation is not an option, but a necessity in the retail industry. Uh, 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 as Kritika mentioned, I am the CEO of Unicommerce, which is India's leading e-commerce focused supply chain SaaS platform, providing order management, inventory management, warehouse management, omni-channel solutions. Established eight years ago, Unicommerce is a market leader processing over 20% of India's e-commerce transactions with over 10,000 plus customers across India, Middle East and Southeast Asia. Coming to today's discussion, we all know that COVID-19 has impacted businesses and brought with itself a truckload of changes that no one could have preempted. Even though it seems like it was yesterday, but it has been four months since our country went into a lockdown. The lockdown, which seemed like an impossible idea to live with, has become our new re reality now. As more and more people, work and livelihood started moving online, it led to brands rethinking their business goals to keep up with the evolving consumer habits. And thus we saw a lot of innovation happening by businesses as everyone around us started adjusting to the new reality. We saw innovations in the product, including new product launches focused on hand sanitizers and other related areas. So innovations in supply chain uh, with focus on hyper-local and even concepts such as store on wheels. And even in the ways in which brands are communicating with the consumers with more focus on safety, hygiene, along with establishing newer channels for connecting with consumers such as WhatsApp, telecommerce, and website platforms. Thus, brands have now realized a huge role of adopting technology solutions to driving business growth. Today, we have business leaders of some of the biggest CPG brands of our country present with us, and we will be talking about the various steps being taken by them to drive innovation within their respective organizations. We will break the discussion on innovation in two phases. The first phase will be a survive phase, which is essentially the last four months where the brands adopted innovation to survive in the new reality and revive phase, which refers to the future where the economy is in the revival mode and what innovations are being planned by them to meet the consumer demand in the future. The discussion will also touch upon how these organizations are using the external ecosystem of startups, academia, or other service provider to drive innovation within their organizations. So before we begin the discussion on the topic, why innovation is not an option, but a necessity in the retail industry, I would request my esteemed panelists to introduce themselves. Starting with um, Ms. Shruti Kashyap. 
Hi, hi everyone. Uh, so uh, great to be part of this panel. Thank you, NASCOM uh, and Kapil for having me. Um, so I am the CIO for uh, Hindustan Unilever and the head of uh, IT for South Asia. Um, Hindustan Unilever, uh, hopefully, you know, all of you are uh, consumers of uh, some of our products, if not all. Uh, we're the largest FMCG in India with a turnover of uh, 6 billion euros. Uh, uh, half a billion actually added after the Holix acquisition that happened few months uh, back. Globally, Unilever is a 50 billion euro organization. Uh, and we play in three main categories, which is uh, beauty and personal care, foods and refreshments, and home care. Um, and then just, you know, uh, uh, sort of continuing the thread that, you know, Dr. Dave started in the morning. Uh, we are a company that believes strongly in purpose. Uh, you know, our, our three line motto is that brands with purpose grow, uh, companies with purpose last and people with purpose thrive. Uh, Unilever's uh, purpose and also HUL's purpose is to make sustainable living commonplace. And a lot of our brands like Dove, Lifebuoy, et cetera, are really the brands that uh, help us live this purpose in the current times. Uh, so yeah, that's about me. Sure, uh, thanks Shruti. Uh, Ashish, if you could have your introduction, please. Sure. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Nascom and Kapil for having me here. Um, my name is Ashish Grover. I am managing director for Fellabella India and also I had e-commerce technology for the whole group. Uh, let me take 30 seconds to introduce uh, Falabella. I assume many of you may not know this uh, name. Uh, Falabella uh, is a very old, 130 year old uh, conglomerate based out of South America. Uh, our headquarters is in Chile. Uh, we operate in seven countries in South America, including um, Chile, which is our uh, uh, headquarters, uh, Peru, uh, Colombia, Argentina, Uruguay, Mexico, and Brazil. Uh, we opened India office about two and a half years back, uh, you know, primarily focused on digital technologies. Um, the Falabella Group uh, is multiple retail units. So we have a department store, home improvement store, supermarket, online marketplace. We also have a bank, credit cards, insurance business, and we also have a real estate and we build malls uh, and shopping centers. So a big conglomerate and multiple businesses and creating an ecosystem. The primary reason India office was uh, open was to expedite um, digital transformation uh, and bring innovation to the whole group. Uh, India is a hub of all the innovations that are happening, not only in this country, but also providing a lot of talent across the world and those experiences. So I'm very glad, very, uh, appropriate topic uh, for uh, us uh, and the purpose of why India office was even set up. Great. Thanks, Ashish. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, would be great to have your introductions now. Thanks, Kapil. Hello, everyone. Uh, hopefully, all of you are doing well and safe. So, Sanjay Gurbaksani, I work for Mondelez and we have brands like uh, Cadbury Chocolates, Oreo Cookies, hopefully a household name and even much more now during our lockdown periods. Uh, so I lead IT and shared services uh, for Mondelez for the Asia, Middle East, and Africa uh, region, and also digital innovations, intelligent automations uh, for the enterprise. I'll pass back to you, Kapil. Great. Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, so with that, uh, let's start our discussion on innovation. Uh, let's start with the survive phase. So Shruti, uh, uh, maybe we'll start with you. It'll be good for us to understand uh, for Unilever what sort of innovations did you adopt during the last four months? And if you collaborated with any external ecosystem providers for the same? Sure. So um, I think, uh, you know, the, the lockdown took uh, all of us uh, by surprise because it was a complete lockdown. And uh, especially for a business like ours, um, which thrives heavily on the traditional trade channel, uh, with, you know, distributors, factories, and, you know, local Kirana stores shutting down. Uh, it took us a fair bit of time to uh, get things back up and running. Um, and, uh, you know, one of our biggest challenges was just uh, our ability to get uh, feet on street, uh, which is, you know, our salesmen and attendance and so on. And therefore, we had to pivot very quickly around digitizing our retailer. And that became, you know, one of our... Uh, 
you know, core programs uh, around the sales side? How do we enable our retailers? Almost how do we treat them just the way we treat our consumers, the way a consumer can order online, you know, track status, uh, you know, pay online and so on. How do we start treating our local Kirana stores in a similar manner? Um, not to mention the disruption that, uh, you know, this whole space is seeing already with, you know, the Geomart launch and the Amazon Kirana uh, space, etc. Uh, so what we did really was that we did have a program running in this space, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it was uh, sort of, you know, an add-on and running in the background. Uh, what we really did was accelerated that whole program. Uh, we enabled all of our retailers to be able to place uh, orders digitally, uh, to be able to make digital payments to our distributors and creating that sort of an end-to-end -end ecosystem, you know, for a local Kirana guy. Uh, to be able to order, make payments, you know, be able to check his claims and so on, all through, you know, a, a very simple mobile uh, application. Um, so that was one, uh, you know, big intervention uh, that we did on the sales side. Uh, I think the other big leg that was impacted for us was the supply chain side, which is particularly, you know, this whole space around uh, manufacturing and production. Um, where, um, you know, one was just the attendance issue of, you know, uh, you know, not enough people on the shop floor, um, you know, not enough blue collar workers, etc. Uh, and then the other challenge was that with the lockdowns coming in and with, you know, containment zones uh, being defined, etc. Uh, how are we able to then uh, predict, you know, demand uh, in an appropriate manner and service it? Um, and and that needed a, a you know a lot of work around just real time crunching. So being able to leverage data on a geocode level where there's a containment zone, where there's not, uh, and being able to predict uh, and sense uh, you know what's what's the demand that's likely to come, uh, and re redesign you know our supply um, and, and the whole logistic side accordingly. So that that became you know the other big area of intervention. And because, you know, really sales and uh, supply chain are the two sort of pillars for a consumer goods organization, bulk of our, um, you know, uh, investments uh, ended up being in, in these two spaces, of course, you know, with, with that underlying uh, uh, infrastructure of being able to leverage the data uh, appropriately. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned about startups and, you know, how we've leveraged, uh, you know, entrepreneurs in this space. So actually the whole idea of, uh, you know, demand sensing came from one of the startups uh, that we were working with, you know, uh, it, it came in one of our actually NIPP interactions and we just picked up on that and, you know, sort of moved forward with it. Um, and then the other, you know, example that I can give is that as, as our factories came back into operation, um, you know, obviously we had to, again, redefine the new ways of working around, you know, proximity monitoring, temperature checks, uh, you know, uh, distancing even within the factory and how many people are allowed and so on. Where again, we worked with a startup who was able to come up with that sort of, a, you know, mobile application, which we could install on and you know, blue collar and white collar workers who were uh, operating at a factory um, and be able to monitor that uh, sort of seamlessly. Again, something, an area that obviously, you know, we did not expect would come up, but we did see, you know, um, uh, good technology being built in that space fairly fast, which we were able to leverage on. Um, so yeah, so that's that would uh, be probably the two levers that I'd call out uh, from our standpoint in the survive phase. Sure. Thanks so much, Shruti. Uh, it's very interesting to hear uh, the innovations and especially the pace at which the innovation has been ad adopted by your organization. I think it has been the need of the hour. And uh, we've also seen a lot of SMEs or like your, you have given technology to your retailers. We've seen a lot of SMEs also adopt these technologies at a very rapid uh, pace. So uh, I think uh, the push towards digital innovation uh, is, uh, has, uh, COVID has given a necessary push and I think they should stay for the long term. So uh, moving to you, Ashish, if you uh, you could also talk about specifically since uh, you're from the uh, retail space. So in your specific organization, what innovations has your organization implemented in the last four months uh, when the lockdown started? Sure, couple. So um, for us, obviously, like Shruti said, I mean, uh, this whole lockdown uh, was um, kind of a bit surprise. And then um, for us, being operating in different countries um, and making sure we are compliant in each of this country uh, with different regulations was the biggest uh, initial survive phase uh, 
uh, for us. I mean, uh, one of the examples I was talking about was in Colombia, uh, the government declared that there will be certain days where there will be no tax, um, which was a great move to boost the sales and various things, but you have to immediately from a technology perspective, being able to uh, change your invoicing and your financial systems to uh, meet that. Um, so a uh, lot of that, of, uh, the other thing, obviously, which we have seen across the board, not only, uh, I think, across the world, because of stores closures, a lot of uh, load that has come on uh, e-commerce and digital channels. Right. So we have seen unprecedented uh, load in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a number of orders and customers hitting our thing. So we had to very quickly scale the platforms uh, to handle that. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge and biggest opportunity has been coming to all of us in the space of supply chain um, and also uh, customer communication, I would say. Uh, from a supply chain perspective, uh, typically in e-commerce business, at least in Western markets, uh, there is a huge percentage which is click and collect, which basically means you order and you go to the stores and to pick it up, uh, which suddenly changed because now everyone wants a home delivery and you have not done enough in terms of, um, you know, the capacities that you need from a home delivery perspective. And then also... Uh, the communication of track and trace and um, being able to communicate in a timely manner to your customers on the status of the order and, uh, you know, things like that. So those uh, are the challenges we have been focusing on in solving. Um, the last challenge I would uh, touch upon is, uh, you know, some of our stores, especially on the supermarket and a home improvement side, which continue to be open because of uh, essential nature of the stuff that we sell, uh, we had to also implement a solution by which we can do a little bit more booking and a more advanced uh, traffic management within the store. So in fact, with one of our uh, partners, um, we uh, turned around that whole platform in about two weeks. And it was within uh, next two weeks, four weeks, we had that in seven countries and more than 100 stores. Um, so, uh, so that's one example of a place where we have done a lot of startups. We have, been, have an accelerator program or a Startup Connect program as Palabella Group actually running out of India. Uh, we have at least uh, seven or eight startups that we are actively engaged, which are in various stages of uh, production from a financial to logistics, to uh, content management aspects of it. Uh, and we have, you know, another uh, batch of startups that we are planning to enroll in the coming months. So for us, this uh, actually has created an opportunity to be a little bit more innovative uh, in the digital space and leverage startups. Sure. Thanks, Ashish. Uh, I think you rightly pointed out that uh, mo most of the systems, uh, particularly to do with e-commerce, have been really tested for scale, uh, and it was it had to be done at a very, in a very short span of time. And uh, it's interesting to hear a global perspective on uh, how uh, th things are happening in uh, Latin America with the uh, systems or fundamental behavior changes from click and collect to uh, deliveries to their home. Thanks so much, Ashish, for that. Sanjay, over to you. Would love to hear your uh, thought process and as well as uh, the innovations that your organizations had to adopt in the last four months. No, thanks, Kapil. I think you know, of course, Shruti covered. Uh, you know, some of them. Of course, we have also gone big on digitizing our uh, retailers, even our distributors to that uh, fact, and you know, within the factory too, whether it's making sure social distancing exists and things like that. Uh, but I think just to add, right? I, I think. Ashish also made a good point. I think compliance was key. We had to make sure, yes, uh, we make sure our business is run in a very, very compliant manner and that that is not compromised. You know, safety and security was the second thing that we had to look after, making sure that those there is no compromise on those fronts. Of course, then we had to, you know, this also, I don't want to say it came as a surprise, but something that came very, very sudden, especially in India, right? The lockdown just happened overnight. And we had to figure out how to uh, deal with it. I think uh, 
couple of i think that just to add not to repeat what shruti or ashish may have said we went after is also like whatsapp uh, commerce right where now we've allowed our uh, retailers to place orders with our distributors or with us you know via whatsapp uh, chatbots and, and depending on the market you know whether it's viber or or facebook messenger i mean what's being used all these now the retailers can uh, place orders through that also one thing we've taken is now we can suggest promotions almost at a retailer level so where you know promotions were run at a country level or at a region level uh, in the lockdown you know promotions meant could had to be very different based on which city you were in state even to the street you were on uh, whether that street was in a you know red zone or not right so now what this is allowing us is actually to build capability where we can suggest promotions even at a retailer level because we are connecting directly via these digital channels directly to a retailer where in the past we were not right uh, communicating with them so i think that's kind of take a norm I, th- i think the other one is even analytics i've seen is taken off a lot where our business community is really looking for real time insights on what's happening in the market Uh, right almost on a daily basis looking at okay how of course our business is running that you know we were always producing maybe more aggressively now but also how to predict and what's the demand in the market because you can't look at what happened last year anymore or even what happened 3 months before on sales and then demand right now it's just changing every day so making sure we are able to collect this data Uh, and run analytics on it and give it to our in the hands of our business leaders because they're making decisions really now almost on a hourly or a daily basis so making sure they're armed with this uh, with this information the other one was you know on the digitizing the distributors right where or uh, because the challenge was when we entered lockdown was getting stock from our distributors to the local shops right uh, which is in many cases were closed or there was not enough hands on or feet on the ground to kind of move that product uh, from the distributors to the retailers so it was getting these distributors on a digital platform and allowing our consumers like us right going on our on our dtc sites and placing an order directly with a distributor and then going and collecting it from the distributor uh, so we kind of also enable that commerce which you know in the past would never have existed So again, uh, you know, these are some of the ideas we've uh, kind of taken alive in the last uh, few months. Sure. Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, I think uh, very insightful, uh, particularly in the new models uh, that you have implemented, both on uh, WhatsApp and as well as uh, collecting directly from the distributor. And you rightly said we we have also seen a big push on analytics and data-based decision making, more so on these newer models. While data is very limited available, but I think those calls are being taken on these data sets and. there are more focus on ai and ml models as well so uh, that actually lays the foundation for our next phase which is the revive phase while i uh, it's uh, it's really uh, great to see the kind of innovations the three organizations have been putting in but i'm sure now uh, the top management in these organizations realizes that this change is here to stay uh, the consumer behavior has been impacted for the long term or has been changed for the long term so i'm sure these organizations all, all of your organizations are thinking about placing long term bets on what they can do to be able to uh, meet or uh, be able to address the changing consumer demands so in the revive phase i would request all of you to talk about those long term bets that uh, or investment area in innovation that are being uh, going through in your organizations and how are you going about implementing uh, those innovations uh, so ashish maybe we'll start with you on that sure kapil um you know i i as we get into a more long term or mid term view post hopefully sooner the post covid uh, situation uh, we definitely see digital scale will obviously slow down with the store traffic increasing but it will not come back to the uh, old scale so the digital scale will keep uh, improving and our investments in the digital uh, channels is continuing to be strong uh, we think there will be new models uh we are investing on from a, a way we are engaging with the customers and the way we are engaging with our sellers uh are evolving uh we are also focused on providing a lot of good financial solutions which i think will be relevant post um, you know post uh, when the new normal comes and when i say financial solutions i am alluding to 
uh, the payment options that customers would have. I mean, more uh, probably convenient options of installments and things like that. Uh, I think would be needed post uh, the situation. I think similarly, uh, more financial flexibility would be needed from a seller's perspective. So we are investing, given that we also have a bank and a wallet and a insurance business, we think there is a great ecosystem we could build with a retail system on a financial solutions on that. Uh, the other thing we are investing a lot and uh, you know using this time to get better at is a store digitization. Uh, I think we had traditionally, um, you know, thought of uh, stores and digital channels, uh, only few connections, maybe click and collect, but there are better, more opportunities for us to digitize our stores um, and create more digital experiences within the store, uh, not standing in the long queues, making, making pre-appointments. I was talking about a pre-appointment platform, which we built. Uh, we are actually planning to open source it. So I would welcome anyone who wants to use it in their um, stores or uh, in their uh, brands. Uh, some of that we would love to uh, give this as a, our con tech contribution to the uh, community. Uh, so these are some of the things uh, I think that, uh, there will be there. I think supply chain is where we think we have to even get better in terms of our network designs, in terms of how do we allocate our resources given the capacity constraints uh, is another area we think uh, are gonna be the important areas as we get into a new normal. Sure, uh, thanks Ashish. Uh, very interesting areas of investment uh, on, uh, uh, on both financing and retail side. Uh, Sanjay, if you could uh, add uh, the innovations that being, that, that's being planned in your organization now. Sure, you know, a couple of areas I'll touch on. One is, of course, we have to make sure that we stabilize our, you know, direct to consumer e commerce platforms, right? And, and those are here to stay. They will continue to scale, uh, may not be as aggressively, but I, I think they'll definitely be there to stay, right? I think the new business models that we've got into, whether it's WhatsApp commerce or, or others we've touched on, I think those are also here to stay. I think they will continue to evolve. You know, I touched on promotions being built into them you know what's what's the next after promotions and things like that that i think everything will go go digital i think ashish touched on payments and everything i, I think it'll, it'll all completely go digital i don't think they're going to go back to the old normal uh you know anytime i i think these things are here to uh here to stay i think the third area is really personalization right now that everything is gone online we have a lot of consumer data uh, and how do we leverage this data to really uh, target our consumers, you know, offer personalization at scale, right? And, and so that you can, of course, attract them, but also give them what they need, when they need, uh, and where they need it. Uh, I mean, consumers, I think, have also become even more demanding in these times. They want what they need and when they need. And how do organizations like us continue to service that? I think that's you know the thing that we need to really get our hands around at the scale that we are dealing at now uh, because we, everyone's online now, um, right? I think the other one is you know people. I, I just want to touch on this people aspect, which is our most important asset, right? Of how do we also continue to and, and I'm going to use the word innovate, but how do we continue to innovate to keep our teams engaged, uh, keep our teams energized as we continue to work in a very very distributed fashion, right? Because I think initially when we've gone into the lockdown, the first few months, energy was very high. Everyone's, you know, this is the new normal. And But as we are moving on and this lockdown is not ending, how do you continue to invest in our, in our talent that is continuing to stay home, to stay energized, engaged, you know, he healthy? How do they continue to stay well, connected, you know, all that. So I, I think there is some work that I think we as organizations need to probably catch up there and, and figure out how do you kind of, what's the new normal in that space, sure. uh, right? And I'm gonna leave this as a teaser, right? I, I know I'm talking to a very dangerous audience here, but I think it's been great to see how organizations like us have now really stood up uh, and have started innovating, have become more agile, have started making fast decisions. And I think are giving now the startups a run for their money. I think where we went to startups by default in the past saying, you may go much faster. You don't have to deal with the bureaucracy. You're much agile and things like that. I think now we've actually caught up and the startups have to compete with us to kind of stay in, in the business and kind of stay at the forefront. Uh, I'll stop there. Sure. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Sanjay. Uh, a very valid point on uh, handling the teams and uh, making sure that they are motivated to drive innovation and making sure that your systems are ready to handle the scale. Uh, great. So, so uh, Shruti, uh, would uh, would love to hear from your uh, from your perspective as well. How is uh, Unilever thinking about innovations in the long term, given that these changes are here to stay now? Sure. So, um, I just again bucketed into three broad uh, areas. One, I would say, product innovation. Second is new channels, and third is automation. I think uh, product innovation, uh, simply because, you know, like everyone is saying, we don't know how long we are in it, right? I mean, the most optimistic view on the vaccine right now is March, probably. So um, we are seeing an obvious shift in consumer trends, you know, uh, beauty at home, nobody, you know, is uh, visiting salons anymore. Uh, people want restaurant quality meals at home. Uh, and therefore, how do we shift some of our product portfolio? Uh, to fit some of these trends, right? Like, for instance, we were never in that beauty at home segment doing, you know, face masks or facial kits at home, etc. So mm -hmm. a lot of it is going to do with the uh, product innovations. And, you know, it will really depend upon wherever we see the most uptake. Uh, the second one is just around new channels. Uh, you know, Sanjay spoke about it uh, around direct to consumer. That's uh, a very small uh, channel for us. And we really want to invest there. Uh, so that, you know, it gives us that, um, you know, almost ownership of the experience for the consumer end to end, which we don't own today, because we are still reliant, you know, on an Amazon or a Flipkart, if it's the e-commerce channel on the traditional trade or on the, you know, modern trade, etc. So how do we get end to end ownership of the consumer experience and therefore, again, looking at direct to consumer in a big way. Uh, and then I think the other big area which, where we haven't really invested in the past, which is now going to be big, is, you know, this whole space of institutional channels like hospitals and apartment complexes, etc. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, uh, we believe that hygiene, uh, you know, sanitization, all of these, whether there's COVID or no COVID, it's going to be here to stay because, you know, that's that's going to become more of a habit for consumers now. And therefore, how do we leverage a lot of the products that we have in that space and you know, make some of these institutional channels a lot bigger. Uh, and then, you know, the third one, like I said, is uh, automation. Um, so doing more with less, uh, which is, you know, became the need of the R uh, when we saw that, you know, salesman attendance was poor or, you know, shop floor um, attendance was poor, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, whether, how much we can automate a lot of the manual work that we do today, whether it's, you know, just yeah, processing invoices from our suppliers, from our vendors, um, our ability to uh, digitize a whole lot of manual operations that happen at our depots and our factories and so on. Um, that's going to be, you know, quite critical because it just unlocks a lot of productivity and it reduces our reliance, uh, you know, uh, on manual operations. Uh, so those are the three uh, sort of big call outs, I would say. Uh, the other, um, you know, almost sort of uh, collateral impact of this has been that it has helped us really prioritize things and see what's important. So, you know, when we went into lockdown, we had to really rationalize and we only manufactured, you know, the top 20 or 30 percent of our SKU list, which is, you know, a huge deal for a large organization like ours. And therefore, you know, now we are looking at re-looking at the SKU list and really questioning that, OK, what is that ideal SKU list for us to sell? Um, likewise, you know, we had so many digital projects running because, you know, uh, digitization is key on our agenda. But we are now, you know, almost focusing and accelerating only those which are truly business value adding. So that's sort of the collateral impact that as an organization, we are now focusing much more on business value, focusing much more on, you know, what's, uh, you know, really working for us and, and therefore a laser focus, I would say, um, on, on where we see, you know, growth coming from. So, yeah, that would be what we are doing in the revive phase. Sure. Thanks so much. Uh, I think uh, very interesting inputs are given in terms of uh, innovations in different area uh, and should be particularly on the both on the product and uh, as well as uh, driving efficiency within the organization. I think those will be key themes going forward as we enter into the revive phase. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to now take uh, the audience question and answer. Uh, uh, so uh, there is one question that uh, like when all of you were talking about innovation, one question that was running through my mind was that uh you all of you belong to very large organizations right and as the scale, size increases innovation uh, the space of innovation starts to slow down but in these last four months all your organizations have demonstrated significant amounts of innovation i wanted to understand was there any structural change done in the organization design 
in your organization to drive innovation at a much faster pace uh, than is what is usually attributed uh, to organizations of this scale. Uh, maybe Shruti, we can start with you if you can talk about any structural organization level changes that were done to ensure that the innovation could happen. So, um, you know, uh, it was, I would say it, it's not, it's less of a structural change, but I would just say that it is more about redirecting resources to where they were needed. Okay. And so, for instance, very clearly for us, sales and supply chain became core focused because we were trying to get back operations up and running. And sure. if it meant that redirecting, you know, some resources who were working, let's say, on some digital finance project or, you know, on something which is less important at this stage, we ensured that we are, you know, very flexible about those things and we ensured the reallocation happened. And so that, you know, we just have the right number of people working on the right uh, type of projects. That's that's what worked for us. Sure. And Sanjay, was that the case for your organization as well? Anything unique that your organization had to do from a design? I, yeah, no, I, I just to add, I, I, no structural change, but I think more a mindset change, right? I, I think the organization got a lot more open to being open to ideas, you know, innovating, how do we disrupt while a external disruption is happening? I think it just, it became a lot more open. And even when we were running our projects, you know, we need all the checks and balances. How do you manage that balance of making sure, of course, you don't risk the business or the brand, but, you know, so I, I think just a lot, a lot of mindset change and agility just came in sure. uh, into our ways of working. Sure. And Ashish, in your case, particularly because uh, you're in different geographies with the management and uh, with your team here. So how do you like, was that a challenge for driving innovation, particularly during this time? Was something changed on that front as well for you? So two, two things I would highlight. So one is um, I feel a lot of structural per se, but I think the voice of technology in the organization got stronger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the we always, I think for many years with, with digital revolution and digital leveling that is happening, we have been talking about technologies at core, uh, but I think this uh, unfortunate situation gave a practice session of what does a technology at core really means and what does a voice of a technology leader uh, should be and how a technology leader needs to lead business in certain situations. I think that's um, uh, one thing I would highlight if you call an organizational change or a organizational dynamic ch dynamics change that happened. Yeah. The second thing I would highlight from a more uh, situation from me as a leader or fellow as a India office working through uh, in a Latin America was, uh, there was always, I mean, you know, equal leveling field that was there because we were in some ways the innovation arm for it. Uh, it created even more, um, you know, leveling field for everyone. So everyone was working from home. So no one was at office. So no one had any particular advantage to be in the room versus on the Zoom or versus on any other uh, channel you have. So everyone was on an equal a footing in terms of your thoughts and in terms of so it's a good idea thought leadership execution ability wins not who's sitting where wins sure sure thanks uh, so now let me start taking the audience questions uh, uh, so one was about particularly in the survive phase um, with factories uh, there was a risk of uh, contracting covid uh, so a lot of manpower wasn't available or even uh, the uh, the sales staff, etc. Were there specific initiatives taken by your organization, or how did you deal with uh, the lesser manpower available or ensuring safety? Uh, Shruti, you touched upon driving more efficiency and less is more. So, any specific things that Unilever had done to make sure uh, that it did not become an impediment in your growth or innovation? Sure. So I think, um, you know, um, uh, like uh, I think Sanjay also mentioned that, you know, people's safety was quite uh, important. And um, uh, we had to do a lot of hard work initially to ensure that, uh, you know, we take uh, all of our, particularly our blue collar employees and our salesmen who visit stores on a journey and reassure them of what the organization is doing uh, to ensure, you know, their safety. 
so from a factory standpoint whether it was you know the basic procedures around personal protective equipment uh, you know launching this whole social distancing app the fact that you know not more than certain number of people will be allowed on the shop floor um the fact that you can't do meetings face to face um uh, and so on and so forth so just uh, you know sort of taking them along the journey getting their trust getting their input so that they feel comfortable in turning up for work uh, for us was you know um uh, quite crucial likewise for the you know uh, the field force we launched uh, important schemes to uh, you know give them the reassurance that if at all something does go wrong the organization will be there and we will take care not just of the expenses but you know ensuring that you are treated we are obviously also ensured that if it's a containment zone then nobody is going out and servicing anything there and so on so just taking the employees on a journey and you know um uh making sure that they they are part of that procedure and giving us the inputs around uh, you know how we designed our processes that really helped sure sure thanks shruti in the interest of time i'll just take one more question uh, this uh, question had come in about a retailer who has a supermarket in a metro city and big, with uh, the e-commerce uh, retailers like grocers big basket getting things delivered out of the local store uh, the retailers particular supermarket ones are apprehensive about their future in this new reality how do they cope with this new reality what can they do to be a part of this changing consumer behavior uh, sanjeev maybe we'll start with you and ashish you can add from your experience of uh, running such large retail outlets of palabella so sanjeev if you could uh, touch upon what a supermarket retailer can do in these times yeah again this is my personal view right I, you know what a retailer has today is that space um uh, right in a supermarket and does that become a distribution facility where again products are of course delivered but then do they just you know I, again i i was at a reliance store i, I a, a few days back and they've just become a packaging facility where of course they have all the products and they're packing and they're delivering to our consumers right so uh, they don't they're not taking any walk in customers anymore or consumers uh because they've just sealed the shop and all they're doing is packaging and and, and they become a a site that is delivering to consumers at home so i don't know if that's the future if that's the disruption waiting to happen will it ever go back to the old normal I, you know i think it's anyone's guess at this time but i think some of the creative ones are of course using the space using that they are getting stocks and then how do they just become a e-commerce company in short uh, to supply to consumers in the neighborhood Sure. sure ashish if you could uh, add to that yeah no i i think sanjay is absolutely right i think um, you have to figure out how to play in the ecosystem uh, the more and more play is becoming of a ecosystem player and finding your spot in that ecosystem that and your contribution in that ecosystem could be the real estate that you are bringing closeness to the uh, consumer that you are bringing the what you could provide a customer service being in that uh, re, uh, you know proximity nobody else can right and thinking about those versus um, sticking on to the model that has been working for many years i think you have to be the first one to break your own model if you want to survive in this um, ecosystem world sure uh, great thank you so much i think we are, we are fortunately uh, we had a hard stop at 1225 so thanks again uh, all of you shruti ashish sanjay for uh, taking our time today it was a very interesting discussion i personally had a lot to learn i am sure the audience also felt the same thanks again for your time today thank you kapil thank you thank you thank you kapil thank you ashish thank you shruti sanjay always wonderful to have all of you here and thank you and i think this was extremely exciting and very very informative uh thank you and we will definitely circle back to you on 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 different things that we can do together to drive all of this uh you know together and for the ecosystem so thank you again for all your time and and the wonderful inputs thank you and with that uh now we move to the showcase of our uh, startups that we've shortlisted for today yesterday we showcased uh, eight startups and today we have eight more that we have shortlisted uh, for you um and these have been a fine selection of startups from our nipp program the 10000 startups program um you know inputs from um our coe data science uh, our emerge 50 program um and and so i would 
uh, I think it's a great compilation of startups and any questions that you may have or want to connect with the startups, uh, please do ping us and you can, you know, also uh, there's a polling after every uh, startup presence. So I request you to kindly do your polling so that we could get a good understanding of whether you want to connect with the startup and, and what really the ecosystem um, needs. Um, with that, may I request the team to start the demos, please? I'm the co-founder and CEO of AskSit. We offer a conversational AI solution for retail and consumer goods. Um, if you think about your customer's journey, uh, the buying journey is a mix of cognitive, emotive and self-satisfying aspects. As in, uh, you know, when your customer is buying your product, she gets a lot of questions, uh, questions to do, which is about the brand, about the product, the cognitive part but also uh, it is to do with the variety and possibilities she can accomplish, uh, which is the emotive part of buying. And lastly, it's about buying with confidence that she has made the right choice. Uh, unfortunately, not every time the answers are easily available to her uh, and without the answers, she will possibly not buy. Uh, and that's really her opportunity. Can you not humanize her buying journey? Uh, can she not get instant answers to all her questions? Uh, can she not get connected to experts uh, whenever and wherever she wants it? Uh, good news being that the answer is yes, because a large part of our questions are repetitive and you can automate them. Your agents are best at selling. So let them work with only high intent buyers and help you improve your sales. And lastly, AI chatbots are always on virtual agents. So now you can provide consumer value 24 seven. The benefits of doing this comes across as a paradox better service, higher customer value, higher sales, but all this while you're reducing cost. And isn't that great? Uh, that's Ask Sid Value Proposition for you. We have been rated by NASCOM as uh, the number one emerging SaaS company in India. Uh, and same Accenture Ventures also recognized us as one of the most innovative uh, startup companies uh, in the country. Uh, we help consumers buy your products by answering all their questions. Um, and first is we build out a product knowledge base from your product data. Uh, catalog information, uh, images of products, uh, and really carve out that tweet-sized Q&A repository. The chatbot uh, is powered by this repository or knowledge base. Uh, whenever there is a new question, the consumer gets handed over to the agent, but the question enriches your knowledge base. And this allows us to give you precision marketing insights from the conversations data on a continued basis. Uh, this solution is about people like you and us who are really passionate about making customers' life better. And one of our clients in UK, a Fortune 500 brand, uh, they won the best customer service excellence, which was a very proud moment for us. Uh, proven globally, likes of Axon Nobel, Danone, uh, even in India, Himalaya, some of our marquee clients. Uh, every 100 conversations, 11 result in a sale for one client. Uh, automation equivalent to adding 16 agents at 20%. The cost of hiring these agents is the outcome for another client. Um, and lastly, when it comes to implementing AI or chatbot, uh, us it is not about taking a lot of time, a lot of effort on your part. We will help you go live in six weeks with minimal time. And the reason we are able to promise that is the vertical uh, story uh, on retail. So with that, I will end and look forward to hearing back from you. Uh, thank Hi, I'm Shivang and this is Chandralika and we are the founders of Big Things. Big Things is an artificial intelligence company solving a few major problems in the fashion and retail industry today. E-commerce is plagued with clothing returns where many customers order multiple sizes and return all that don't fit or don't look good. Luxury fashion, on the other hand, is difficult to scale online as it depends on physical stores and in-store interactions for sales. Big Things' product suite includes mobile body scanning, virtual avatar generation, automated digital clothing, virtual makeup application, and virtual fashion shows and photo shoots. 
The 3D body scan needs only two smartphone photos, one from the front and one from the side. The software instantly calculates over 44 precise body measurements, which can be used for tailor-made clothing and to find out your size in any brand anywhere in the world. The premium product goes one step further and uses a selfie of one's face in addition to the body scan to create a virtual avatar that looks and measures exactly like you. Big Things is neural networks also identify clothing from any picture and instantly replicate it in 3D to produce digital clothing in a completely automated workflow. This digital clothing can be tried on using one's personal avatar to see exactly how it looks and fits. Big Things' virtual showrooms allow you to browse an entire virtual store in immersive 3D, resulting in 250% greater conversions for your customers. In the COVID-19 crisis, retailers are unable to carry out fashion shows and photo shoots. So to help them, we've adapted our avatar technology to create digital fashion models, which can be used for virtual fashion shows and photo shoots. We produced one of the world's first virtual fashion shows for Fashion Innovation NYC on 5th of June and have received tremendous demand for this service thereafter from brands globally. We have garnered a lot of awards and media attention, notably the world's biggest AI award for the best use of AI in fashion and others from Amazon and even China. To learn more, reach out to us at info at bigthings.com. Hi, I'm Ashish, the founder and CEO of Desire. We are a hyper-personalization platform for fashion. We help retailers know, engage, acquire, and wow shoppers in stores and online. A digital personal assistant personalizes the inventory for each shopper, provides style, fit, and outfit advisory, enables visual searches, renders 3D visualization of outfit, eliminates the need to go to a trial room with virtual trial on and provides WhatsApp and social media integrated chatbots. Desire's deep learning platform also uses image recognition to generate product attributes for your catalog and provides demand and product planning insights that help you with full price sell throughs. 5 million square feet of prime retail space working with some of the largest retailers and malls in India and the UAE. Etisalat, Oracle and TCS are our global partners and our solution has demonstrated significant improvements to conversions, basket size and sales. We have won some awards along the way. We are the top 20 most innovative startups chosen from 6,000 startups globally from 175 countries for Global Change Award 2020, which is considered the Nobel Prize for Fashion by H&M Foundation and Accenture. We are working with Dubai Future Foundation for winning the Etisalat Retail Innovation Challenge, where we are co-building solutions for malls and retailers. Is a demo of how you can leverage our APIs to engage the shoppers anytime, anywhere, through conversational AI and then show a curated store along with style advisory or show fashion inspirations through lookbooks, depending on different uh, occasions. In this example, the shopper, for example, wanted to see some ideas for office wear. So she can click on any item to see similar items as well. These lookbooks are further used for targeted marketing based on past purchases or preference profile or browsing behavior of the customer. Here is another demo of how your shoppers can use our visual search to click or upload any celebrity pick or a random street click to then find similar items in your store and see product attributes based on our deep image recognition. Our outfit builder shows them ready-made lookbooks, 
for that same chosen item and also allows them to create their own looks and visualize the entire lookbook on a 3D avatar or on, or on themselves. To know how we can help you in your innovation journey. Thank you. Today's digital customers are increasingly comfortable in relying on digital information to base their purchase decisions on. And this has influenced physical retail stores from transforming into experience centers. There are various examples from home lifestyle stores to apparel stores to automobile showrooms who have made significant digital investments to aid this transformation. Brands are now feeling the need for this technology to be intelligent, to be able to have a two-way communication and collect actionable data to make data-driven business decisions. It is with a similar vision that we started Dave. Dave is a virtual sales avatar that has the ability to capture actionable data to deliver a personalized value selling experience unique to every customer that Dave interacts with and create a compelling product discovery experience. For example, if your brand has a kiosk, as you will see in the following video, uh, Dave can be deployed in these kiosks either in a store or in a BTL event as a conversationally intelligent virtual sales avatar. Good morning. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing good. Very good. Is this the first car you're looking to purchase? Yes. No, I already have one. Great. Do you intend to drive this car to office every day? Yes. As you saw in the video, Dave has the ability to capture customer attributes using facial detection, GDPR compliant facial detection. And Dave has the ability to capture more than 60 attributes to understand who your customer is. Not just that, but further ask pertinent questions to gauge the customer's requirement. Dave then uses this understanding about the customer and Dave's understanding about product and its features to make a personalized product recommendation. One of the unique features of Dave is that it's not a static recommendation engine, but is able to adapt to changing customer information in real time during the conversation. This whole experience of Dave can be deployed across different scenarios. For example, on a digital signage, either inside the store or any physical retail space. <laughs> Dave can be deployed as a virtual sales avatar across any customer touch point that the brand prefers to. Hi, do you want me to be your brand's avatar? With this value proposition, Dave is able to improve lead qualification rates, improve conversion rates for brands and the overall product discovery experience for customers. We are EcoSocial and we amplify digital content on social media. We are a 100x VC portfolio company and a part of the Startup India initiative and the NASCOM 10K Startups program. Nobody is a stranger to advertising on social media. Your kid wants that latest pair of Skechers shoe not because they saw it on TV or on a website. They want it because it was trending on Instagram, because influencers are sharing and talking about it. But you'll be surprised by the lack of relevant data and metrics in this exploding universe of information. Brands lost over $1.3 billion to fraud in this space. Which brings us to our core problem. Can we get brands to trust social media influencers? Reco is a software platform that uses data science to build a trusted influencer network. 
At the heart of our system, I built a predictive influencer scoring model, the RECO score, that lets you compare the potential of influencers based on how much return on investment they can generate. How effective is it? Let me tell you about one of our first clients. Ashur is a funded hair and skin clinic in India, and they spend a lot of money with celebrities to share skin and healthcare tips. But they get really poor engagement for all this great content on their social media pages. They used our software to amplify the celebrity content and they get 400 times more engagement. Yeah, 400 times more. We tested this with multiple campaigns so far with similar outcomes. We bring the right set of experience and expertise in this space. I am a technology specialist and a serial entrepreneur with 16 years of experience in building fraud management systems across the world. My co-founder Naveen is a performance marketing specialist who was among the first to use influencer marketing way back in 2008. Our platform has a subscription-based model with the enterprise edition price at $1299. There's an additional 10% camp fee on campaign spent exceeding $13,000. Globally, the influencer marketing spend stood at $8 billion in 2019. Influencer spend in India was at $400 million and is growing rapidly, even beyond the metro. So the takeaway here is this is an $8 billion global opportunity. Reco is a software platform that amplifies branded content through a trusted network of influencers. And we have early traction. We would love for you to be a partner with us in this journey. Availability, visibility, and accessibility. These three factors influence sales in a significant way in the retail industry. Can the consumer find the product easily? Does he see the product in his daily routine? Can he experience the product easily in some way? Looking at consumer packaged goods companies, CPG brands deploy visual merchandising in offline stores to get their customers' attention. Through online medium, they deploy various mechanisms to connect with their customers. Augmented reality and virtual try-on are the most effective ways to connect and influence their customers. We help CPG companies, retail companies in general, connect with their customers and measure the effort spent in this connection. Smart way, both online and offline. Salespersons open the app, click an image. We convert this image into actionable insights. Within seconds, we bring back KPIs such as out of stock, share of self, planogram compliance, competitor presence, POS displays present or not, everything in real time, so that the salesperson can take action on the spot. We also offer a retail analytics dashboard for the managers who are monitoring the merchandising activities on the field. Leaving no gap in product execution makes it really efficient and managers can strategize their visibility execution in a smart way. The online way of connecting with consumers has become more important than ever given the current scenario. The world of e-commerce is changing into AR commerce, be it footwear, be it eyewear, be it a beauty product, and even food product. So we are using cutting edge technology to enable virtual visual merchandising. To digitize the products, we are not just using 2D images, but we are using 3D models, which are built by 360 imaging of the product. We are using AI to detect features on this product, make 3D modeling much more efficient. We are optimizing and rendering these 3D models in augmented reality for the consumers to experience and interact. So we are bringing visual merchandising to the consumer's home so that they can experience it at the comfort of their home and shop online. And this helps increase the sales for the brands. With our AI-based product extract, we are helping our customers save 40% time in their merchandising checks and make decisions right on the spot for offline stores. With our online visual merchandising product experience, we are helping Indomie, a Tolaram Group brand, present photorealistic 3D models of their noodle recipe to their consumers so that they can create and connect with the customers and increase their sales. 
were helping our customers connect with their consumers using augmented reality and helping them measure the effort spent in this connect using AI, both online. Hi everyone, my name is Tejas. I'm part of Yellow Messenger uh, and I'm responsible for uh, building global partnerships, uh, retail partnerships for uh, Yellow Messenger today. Um, and so talking about Yellow Messenger, uh, we are a conversational AI platform. Uh, we power automation for close to 250 plus uh, customers globally. Um, and uh, we, we've been able to help brands uh, like uh, McDonald's, Domino's, Aldo, Mondelez, etc uh, to engage and promote directly with their consumers uh, through popular communication channels uh, like uh, whatsapp facebook messenger telegram viber uh, and also we've recently tied up with uh, google uh, to bring google business messenger to india uh, and we and we feel this could be a, a game changer today. Uh, we are also seeing a significant demand um, for an end-to-end -end, uh, commerce experience on social channels uh, from brands uh, today. Uh, and also uh, traction from end users uh, has been phenomenal. Uh, we offer uh, out-of-the-box use cases uh, right, uh, right from product discovery, uh, product recommendation, order placements, and uh, feedback. Right. Um, so our robust uh, platform um, handles over 1 billion uh, messages a quarter, uh, offering automations uh, in uh, 100 plus international languages. Uh, plus, we have uh, out of the box integration with most popular uh, commerce platforms uh, like Shopify, Magento, SAP, uh, and also multiple uh, payment uh, gateway uh, solutions as well today. Uh, our goal uh, is to bring down uh, your delivery timeline um, our goal is to provide you the expertise uh, to build uh, human-like conversations uh, where uh, the users are able to uh, query about your products and services in natural language uh, and uh, get human-like responses, understanding the uh, intent accurately. Right. Um, so uh, we've been uh, so uh, Yellow Messenger today uh, is able to help you with the uh, with, with your uh, customer uh, lifecycle management. Uh, right from uh, your customer support conversations uh, to live agent support, uh, um, running campaigns, uh, and also uh, uh, conducting surveys to understand your customer feedback. Right, uh, And uh, to tie this all up, we also provide you a deep analytics, uh, which is uh, today uh, can give you uh, insights about uh, type of customer queries, uh, type of customer issues uh, in terms of uh, as, uh, to the granular level of uh, city uh, or state uh, or, or what category of customers are asking you these kind of queries, right? Uh, so using Yellow Messenger, brands are able to uh, today uh, increase uh, their lead generation significantly, increase sales uh, significantly, and at the same time, bring down uh, customer support costs. So happy to support you uh, if you have a requirement uh, for uh, social commerce. Uh, happy to talk to you all uh, further. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, this is uh, Sudarshan, uh, co-founder of uh, Jingle Bid. Uh, I am uh, very delighted to present our uh, product uh, to NASCOM retail tech event. Uh, Jingle Bid is a reverse auction uh, marketplace. I am going to give you a short story where we started. Uh, one year back I was uh, searching to buy a refrigerator and uh, I, I checked uh, prices in multiple uh, physical stores. I checked with one store, with that price I went to the second store, he reduced a little. 
and I went to the third store. He uh, he almost reduced five percent from the first store I inquired. So uh, almost uh, three stores uh, were giving me a different uh, pricing. So I thought, why can't there be an app where I can go and ask for a product, and all these three sellers can uh, bid in real time, and. Uh, uh, I can accept the best price and they can di directly deliver the product. We create a uh, scalable B2C uh, commerce app uh, where people can bid for any product in a reverse auction way and this uh, request can go to multiple sellers and like, bid, uh, they can bid that best price and uh, uh, we can accept the best price. right? So that's how uh, we started the uh, uh, product called Jingle Bid. So the problem we uh, solve is today uh, we don't have any idea what product uh, a nearby store uh, holds, right? So let's say you want to buy a Redmi phone. We have no idea of which seller has that product near to you. And uh, once you find a seller, you, you you're not sure whether you're getting the right price, right? So and also there are multiple sellers near to you hold the same product. So you have to spend time and finding uh, who will give you the best price. And again, the third problem would be the delivery, right? So uh, if we could connect the nearest seller to you, the delivery would be uh, very easy, right? So th these three problems we solve. One is price, uh, second one is availability, and third one is delivery. So uh, uh, pro product is really simple. Uh, you can come to our app just like any other e-commerce application and uh, you can choose a product let's say you want to buy an iphone and uh, this particular request will go to multiple sellers uh, near to you and uh, everyone will give that best price and also they have an option to counter bid as well in case if a seller gave a price and the other seller gave a uh, better price uh, this first seller has an opportunity to give a better price so this would benefit the buyer in a big way uh, to get the best to the seller and he directly delivered to the product deliver the product to the buyer thank you So thank you everyone and it's been an absolute pleasure and honor to be uh, anchoring this program and uh, we look forward to continued conversation with all of you and uh, please do ping us um, or reach out to us if you need to connect with any of these startups. We will be back with two more sessions in, in during mid-September so please do stay tuned into our uh, uh, handles and for more information. And last but not the least, I definitely like to thank our sponsor Target for uh, making this program totally possible. Thank you so much. And uh, do look forward to all of you joining in for our next couple of sessions as well. Thank you so much.